Welcome back to Three Go Searching by Patricia St. John. Chapter 10, The Message of the Stars. After a bath and a long night's sleep, there seemed no particular reason why David should not go back to school as usual. But he found it rather difficult to start life again as though nothing had happened. And he was not particularly easy to live with during the next few days. He had had a bigger shock than he knew, and he was tired and cross and kept wanting to cry when there was nothing to cry about. He teased Joan until she cried too, and his school teacher often found him not paying attention to his lessons. By Friday night, he was miserable and fed up. He wandered out into the garden and met Waffy. Hello, said Waffy. Want to go down to the beach? It's safe now. I'm not allowed to, answered David, scowling. Not anymore. Not without Dad. <clears throat> oh, said Waffy. Oh, well, let's play in the garden then. Let's play with your bow and arrows. But Waffy, as usual, wanted the best and tried to snatch the straightest arrow every time. And David was in no mood to lose the game. You're cheating, said David crossly. You've got the best bow and the straightest arrow. Trade with me and I'll win easily. I haven't, retorted Waffy. They're all the same. You have. They're not, shouted David, losing his temper and making a grab at the bow. Waffy hung on and David pulled. The result was as might be expected. There was a sudden crack and the bow snapped in half. You, you, shouted David furiously. You've broken my best bow. You always break my things. I'll never play with you any more. And I don't want to play with you any more, answered Waffy coolly, flinging his piece lightly into the bamboos and turning scornfully on his heel. I don't want anything more to do with you, or anything more to do with Christians either. Christians are as selfish and cross as other people. There's no difference. He walked up the path rather slowly, half expecting David to run after him. But David had turned away to hide the tears that had started and was standing by the fence, looking out over the sea, a big lump in his throat. So this was the end of his hopes and prayers. He'd prayed so hard Waffy would be a Christian, and now it was all spoiled. Waffy would never want would never believe now that Christians were different. And David half wondered if they really were. He looked down at the broken bow he had made with such care a couple of weeks before. Bows never lasted very long. They always broke sooner or later, and then you made another. So had it really been worth getting into such a fight? His gaze wandered over the sea, and the gray-blue sky tinged with pink. He had often come to his private little corner under the mimosa tree in the evening to look at the sky. And it was always beautiful at sunset, even when he was cross and bad-tempered. The best things never broke or got spoiled or changed, like the sea or the sunset or the stars or God. Very soon the moon would rise and there would be a silver track across the sea, like on the night when he had been so frightened and he knew Jesus had been with him. Perhaps because Jesus never changed, he would always come when David was in need. Perhaps he would come now because David was sorry and longing to be good. Perhaps it was only David himself that kept changing. It was a comforting, steadying thought, like finding a rock to stand on when you thought you were being carried out of your depth by a big wave. 
I'm sorry, he whispered, standing very still. The beauty all around him stole in on his sadness and comforted him. A small gull rose up on white wings and flew away into the sunset. A pink feathery cloud drifted above the lighthouse on the far headland. The star that he always saw first was suddenly there, shining in its right place. Nothing was spoiled or broken except the bow, which did not matter any longer, and his hopes and prayers for Waffy, which could probably be mended if he said he was sorry. He turned around slowly, because he did not want to say sorry to Waffy. It had been the fault of both of them. He was glad there was nothing to be done about it then. Waffy would certainly have gone home, and it might be easier in the morning. But Waffy had not gone home. He was particularly anxious to be said sorry to, as he wanted to go on the expedition next day, and his pride would make it impossible if he and David were not still on speaking terms. So, when, on looking back, he had seen David standing under the mimosa tree, he had decided to wait. He knew that standing under the tree and gazing out to sea always had a good effect on David's temper. So, as David strolled around the corner of the house, he came face to face with Waffy, sitting on the doorstep. Both little boys surveyed each other cautiously. Then Waffy moved over and made room. After a little hesitation, David accepted the unspoken invitation and sat down beside him. If they squeezed close together, there was just room for both on the step. Sorry, said David. Sorry, said Waffy. You can come tomorrow, said David. I'll make you another bow, said Waffy. I'll let you shoot the straight arrow, replied David. They sat on in silence, thinking how nice it was being friends again. The dusk grew deeper around them, and the stars came out one by one. Then David's mother called him in to supper, and Waffy started home for the second time. But Waffy walked slowly, thinking hard. How quickly David had come back and said sorry. How forgiving he had been about the broken bow. Waffy had quarreled with all the other boys because he was so selfish and always wanted the best of everything, and it never came out right. They never said sorry, and Waffy just went on feeling angry and unforgiving. If Christians could put things right like that, he would like to be a Christian, for boys could be fierce and cruel when they quarreled. How peaceful it had been sitting on that step together after they both said sorry. What did it mean to be a Christian, he wondered. What did you have to do? David could tell him, no doubt, but he was too proud to ask. His father would be very angry if he mentioned such a thing, and he did not dare go to Sunday school. Then he remembered they were going out to the village next day, and the doctor would read the book to the people. Perhaps he would tell them how to become Christians, and Waffy would listen hard. If it was a cure for fear and a cure for quarreling, it was worth understanding. David ate his supper rather quietly, and his mother, who had seen the end of the fight out of the kitchen window, watched him thoughtfully and wondered what he had been thinking about standing there weeping with his broken bow under the mimosa tree. Something had happened, for he was no longer the restless, irritable, unreasonable little boy he had been at dinner time. He was particularly good 
and helpful and cleared the table and swept up the crumbs without being asked. I don't know what I'd do without you, David, said Mother gratefully. You've made the room so nice and tidy. And do you know, David, I'm going to need your help more than ever soon because something's going to happen. What? asked David, who was riding the broom around the table. It's a big secret, said Mother. When you are in bed, I'll tell you. What is going to happen? thought David as he washed a little, as little of himself as possible and hurried into his pajamas. He ran into the living room and skipped three times around the table because he was so happy. All the crossness of the last few days had gone like a dream and he was feeling good again. Tomorrow, he was going to the village with Dad and Waffy. Tonight, there was a secret and he knew it was a nice secret by the way Mother had spoken. Are you ready, Mother? He called, bouncing on his bed. Nearly, called back his mother, who was tucking in Joan. Well, hurry up, because I want to know about that thing you told me, shouted David. They mustn't mention, mention the secret to Joan, because she wasn't going to be told. She was too small to understand. It was a grown-up secret to be shared between David and Mother. You'll break those springs, David, warned Mother. Get into bed at once. So he got in, and she came and knelt down beside him, as she always did when there was anything special to tell. And tonight, it was very, very special. David could hardly believe it. After Mother had gone away, he lay thinking and thinking about it in the dark. They were going to have a new baby in only two months. When the flowers were out in the fields and the garden was full of white lilies, before it got really hot, before the Easter holidays, the baby would have arrived. It would be his own baby, and he would help Mother plan the names. If it was a girl, he wanted rose because the rosebuds were just coming out in the garden. But if it was a boy, he wanted Peter because Peter had walked on the sea and Jesus had come to him across the waves. His mother would need him very badly because Joan was scarcely more than a baby and dad was out such a lot. She would be in bed at first and then she would feel tired for a time, and even when she was quite well again, there would be a lot of extra work, feeding the baby, bathing it, washing its clothes, singing it to sleep. He tried to remember what it was like when Joan was born, but at five years of age, he had not felt responsible and had barely noticed what was happening. Now it was different. He felt all ready for this baby. Then suddenly he remembered, and he clenched his fists under the covers. He was going away to school only five months after the baby was born, and he would have to leave it behind for a whole year. He had minded before, but now he minded ten times more, and two hot tears trickled down his cheeks. Oh, God, he whispered into the darkness, please let something happen so I don't have to go. I want to be a missionary when I grow up, and I don't need lots of lessons to be a missionary. I could stay here and learn with Dad and help with the new baby. Oh, please don't make me go. He dried his tears on the sheet and stared out of the window. It was a clear night, and every star was shining in its own right place, each lighting its own little patch of darkness. They would stay steadfastly on in their own appointed places until their tiny glow would be lost in the breaking of the dawn and the darkness would be scattered. But David was too young and too sad to understand the message of the stars. 
He turned away from the window and burying his face in the pillow, he wept bitterly.